Hello and welcome to the Movie Dean Podcast. Today I'm delighted to welcome Mike McGee, who is a, one of the founders of Framestore. And for the one or, or two people who haven't heard of the name Framestore uh, on the listenership, Mike, welcome to the Movie Dean Podcast. Thank you very much. Can we just dive into Framestore and the founding story, Mike? But briefly offline, before before we dialed in, you were telling me about the how you brought together three or four players to starting in pop videos and frame stores now at Chancery Lane with 800 people in a very, very impressive building, which presumably visual effects artists love to come and work in. Yeah, so we, we started back in the yeah, late 80s uh, doing pop videos, television title sequences. There were five of us that had worked, um, worked on a few pop videos and could see the opportunity of some, a new piece of technology uh, to actually work frame by frame on video. And we could see the potential of what it could do. So we invested in a piece of kit, untried piece of technology, and just it just grew and grew from there. And as you say, 32 years later, uh, the original five are now, we have a thousand people in this building, global offices, and a total headcount of 2,700 people now across the globe. As I came up in the lift, you know, it's, it's a very visual experience in itself, and you've got floors of, you know, I could, I could make out one or two, you know, visual effects teams, you know, an advertising team. There's a whole, you know, the whole gamut of different production you know, capabilities inside the building. You know, is that something that was in the original vision for the business or is that obviously completely grown now with the new platforms and, and, and distribution that customers demand? The original vision really came from five very diverse people. Each of us, my, my creative partner, was, in, was studied archaeology. I did graphic design. So immediately a lot of the people that were coming into the industry were coming from all sorts of different diverse backgrounds. Today we still employ a huge range of, of skills. So we have physicists, mathematicians, computer scientists and coders. And we team them up with people like myself as a graphic designer. We have fine artists, photographers, writers and directors all under one roof. And for us it's, it's the combination of science and art that make us able to solve uh, our, our clients' challenges. You know, obviously over 32 years, I mean, brand value is such a huge you know, part of the game in, in this business and, and people want to be associated with the frame store brand, whether that's an individual artist at the beginning of their journey or whether it's a, you know, a, a movie studio that wants you know, the, the added collateral or the added value of that frame store name. How, how has that helped open doors? Well, the, the, the heritage we've built up from um, winning awards, from taking on challenges that need genuine innovation, I think that's, that's our key uh, differentiator, is the fact that we take on the impossible jobs and we find solutions to them. And because we've, we've built a track record of doing that and, and been very successful at using the constraints of deadlines and budgets to come up with creative solutions, clients come back for more and more of it. It also attracts talent. So talent want to be working on the most groundbreaking piece of work or the most high profile piece of work. So making sure that you're constantly working on projects that have that profile, that give uh, the rewards back to the very talented artists that we have is really important to our business. I mean, the, the showreel um, is such an important thing. You're only as good as your last film or your last piece of work. And, uh, you know, I suppose that, um, you know, in a world that is so moving fast, so moving forward, and so quickly, you know, there's there's lots of different you know, t techniques, types of productions that are required, and and uh, you know, we, we were talking offline about influencers and people using mobile phones and actually distribution on iPad and phones. You know, how how is a business like Framestore geared to deliver for that new generation technology? Well, we used to have a, a separation between film and television because they were two different resolutions. The resolutions now have, have all merged together and really it doesn't matter whether we're working on a, four, a small uh, flat screen the size of a telephone or whether we're working on a giant outdoor screen or whether we're working in the worlds of virtual and augmented reality where you have a full 360 degree canvas to work on. You still need good stories. You still need, you still need memorable and arresting imagery to create, uh, and I've seen this in VR, uh, the biggest impact, creating genuine first-time experiences for people. And that for brands is, is gold. If you can give someone a memory because it's the first time they've done something and associate that positively to their brand. So what we're, what we're finding is that we're putting people's skill sets from 
um, feature films and from creating cinematic uh, visuals into um, generating solutions for mobile platforms or tablets and creating, again, groundbreaking pieces of work. So, you know, a project like Gravity, for example, will, will, will draw in you know, global brands wanting to work with the business. And, and does that bring its own challenges of, of not having that intermediary sort of agency context or, or account handlers wanting to get closer to the production? And there's, there's an interface there which is you know, typically been a challenging one. Yes, um, we get a lot of uh, brands that have their own creative teams in-house that will see a piece of work we've done and approach us to do that. Um, we've had uh, we've had quite a bit of success working direct to brand. We now have categories of work that we call direct to brand. Um, but along with that also comes the challenges of how you handle that work. For us, we've had to learn uh, agency skills. We've had to become part agency to be able to look after clients' expectations when you're handling not just their job, but their brand and their also their, their wider um, advertising spread. It's not just the one project you're on. You have to be aware of their, what they want to achieve, what their messaging is trying to attain, and also be able to go back, go back with um, a solution that might be different, slightly different to the one that they came in, came in with. Um, and something like the field trip to Mars that we made, which, which turned a bus into a giant VR headset, moved such a long way from the original concept that came in, which was, I think, originally it was just for a new website. Um, but we can add um, not just technical solutions, but also creative thinking and brand association to the projects we deliver now. On that, that VR, sort of VR, AR piece, I mean, people verbally bucket those two things together and the fact that they couldn't be further apart. You know, uh, augmented reality is, is almost behaviourally there already because everyone's walking around with a mobile phone. Virtual reality is, is very expensive and quite inaccessible, but, you know, inspirational and amazing when experienced at the level that you're producing here. How, how do you see those two worlds playing out? I think VR and AR at the moment are very, they're, they're very separate in that at the moment you put a VR headset on, it blocks out the world, it's a singular um, experience. AR brings CG or, or um, artificial elements into the real world, and whether you're in a headset or whether you're looking at it through a, a device, um, it, it, it's bringing things into your world. For us, I, I, I think there's a crossover. Um, mm. The Mars bus was a great example. It was 30 people uh, with, a, with, a bu with a bus that was turned into a giant headset. So it mixed, augmented with uh, virtual realities. I think uh, the potential of putting a, a, an augmented headset on and going to a concert where things come off the stage or are actually happening around you, um, again, provide another, another way of um, consuming content that we, that we haven't even considered yet. And, and the blurring, there will be a blurring of what is VR and what is AR. Because in an AR headset, you can actually block out the real world and make it VR. Mm -hmm. And then it's just how you design the experience. I mean, in, in fairly layman's perspectives, um, AR is sort of involves quite a lot of movement because you're moving around the real world and you're, you're, you're experiencing, you know, Astons or content or animation inside the world. Whereas VR, you're, you're stationary. So arguably, what, one of them might lead to more couch potatoes and one of them might need to in a AR people. <laughs> but I think I think no, I, I wouldn't agree with that because I think some of the experiences we've made in VR, right. you can walk around a VR environment. Okay, you don't have to be limited sure. uh, by where you where you yes, it's what you see. You can so there are um, companies like the Void yeah. that that make flat surfaces and you can reach out and touch these surfaces whilst you're in a virtual world. Sure, and there are real objects that match up with what you're seeing. Suppose, and then you can move through. I suppose the accessibility piece, though, the, the cost the cost of that equipment and, and the accessibility, whereas, whereas everyone's got one of these iPhones or Android devices in their pocket and, and can participate in the... the you know, I, I find, find if I liken... I have likened in the past, um, you know, AR, AR content to uh, space junk. It's kind of out there, but you don't really know, you know, until you've got your lens up in front where, where it is, what it is. Or if you're in a museum, you know, yes. I want to you know, have an interview with the artist, etc. So there's, there's so much, uh, you know, there's a whole new world of content that is actually currently invisible, which I understand by 2020 is going to be a $108 billion business. And so there's going to be a content, there's going to be a content surge to fill that market. And that's probably something you're gearing to, you know, preparing to, 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 to deliver for. 
Yes, very much so. We, I, I think for, for children going to museums or institutions, art galleries, the, the opportunities to make them much more immersive and exciting is, is huge. We, we did an experience for the Natural History Museum where you can download an app to your phone, put your phone in some Google Cardboard, and then school children point at the dinosaur bones on display, and then those bones get covered in blood vessels, muscle tissue, skin, come alive, step off the off their exhibit rostrum and walk around you and i and, and you see the kids faces they, they, they don't care whether that's virtual or augmented mm. whether how they're viewing it they're just having an amazing an amazing time so i think that's that's what will happen for the generation i think that will naturally consume this material is it'll just be there yeah. they won't be separating yeah. what platform it is i mean the, the the process of experiencing that content is so amazing and 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 sort of inspirational and it's so far removed from the process of making it which is incredibly painstaking filled with a technological and hardware workflow um, but at Mavidium you know we're, we're big on people solve workflow problems I mean obviously you need the technology and the hardware and the organization but actually it's people and so perhaps we can move on to the people in your team and what sort of backgrounds they come from and, and how you over the last 30 years you've identified the teams for the projects that have come through the door? So we, when, when we look at employing uh, new people, we're looking for somebody that today is, we used to look for people that were specialized in doing one thing. Now we're much more about finding a T-shaped person. Yeah. So someone that has a broad range of skills, that has a broad range of interests as well, but is able to drill down into something uh, when, when required. So when we're putting a team together, Often the influences that come to the table, to the ideas part of the project at the beginning, the problem solving part, are very diverse. And we will have mathematicians and physicists alongside designers and animators. And it's, it's the clever combination of, of those people's skills and their ability to communicate their ideas as well. I think communication is still 70% of, of what we do as, as a business, even though people think of us as a technology company, is being able to talk about your ideas, to um, understand a brief, and then to be able to share your thoughts back with the rest of the team or with an external person that pushes that project across the line, makes it understood, and then allows your team also to work together to, to find the best solution. I mean, T-shaped people is probably a reflection as well of, of, of the platforms and the number of different types of deliverables that, that, are, that are required. And, you know, there's obviously specialism is incredibly important. I mean, you know, you, if, you, if you go into any sort of behind the scenes of, a, of, a, of a, your productions, you, you see this remarkable detail and deep dive into you know, green screen technology, the visual effects, the depth and the work that goes into you know, reflect, reflections, the water, all, all these things that the viewer takes, takes for granted. Can you tell us about the time frame that one of these big big executions takes? So, for example, a gravity, the, the, the sequence in gravity or a sequence in Paddington. The time frames of projects obviously come down to the amount of complexity and whether you're being innovative, where you have to step away quite often from your computers. So, on a movie like Gravity, we literally have a team of artists that will create the visuals. They sit at a computer and they look through the portal of a screen and create uh, worlds with inside the computer. But to achieve some of the effects, we had to step away and design and create pieces of engineering that could allow us to capture the live action material in a, certain, in a very accurate and um, certain way. So we converted a car manufacturing production line robot into a high-speed motion control camera. We built a specialist body motion simulator that could move the actors, uh, but be driven by our animation data from CG. We also built a 360-degree light box with a ceiling and a floor and four walls to create a new interactive way of lighting the talent instead of shooting them against a blue screen. So each of those solutions was a combination of engineering, software design, and people yeah, building a physical piece of apparatus or adapting a piece of existing technology. So that's something we do more and more, which is to, to take our uh, clever thinkers and design physical pieces of equipment to help us achieve the best effects. I think in, in that, that physical world, it is remarkable. It's, it's almost robotic on some of these huge sets now, but you also 
begin with the visual effects domain to get into this artificial intelligence space and you know, machine learned machine learning space, which is which is you know doesn't terrify me as much as it terrifies others, but because it takes the heavy lifting and the time and the render time out because you know, it, it's repeat work, which at the moment is being done by an expensive human being when it can be done by you know, probably at the moment an expensive machine. But but how is AI and artificial intelligence lightening the load? For us at the moment, AI is still not a tool that we're using very much because um, a lot of a lot of what we do, as you say, is it's it's people driven. It's large teams of people. Even if they're drawing around Sandra's outline like they did in Gravity, mm -hmm. we had this wonderful way of lighting her, but we still had to cut her out. And and a project like Gravity took four and a half years to finish with a team of four hundred people. So you're right, if there was a way that we could reduce those numbers by automating some of the simpler processes or some of the more automated processes, that would be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're looking to do, is to be able to find a way to, to have AI take some of that more mundane work out of the pipeline and then free those artists up to do more of the creative uh, thinking and creative problem solving that we'd love to have them do. Mm. Uh, Mavidian, we use an ex expression which is stories make us human. Um, and, you know, telling authentic stories is increasingly important in, in a very, very noisy, uh, you know, online connected world. Um, how, how, how have you seen, you know, cut through, you know, of a fantastic piece of media or a fantastic commercial, you know, change? I mean, you know, what, what, what does the term viral mean to you today? <laughs> Well, for me, we often get people come in and sit with us around and say, we'll have a viral one, please. We have a yes, viral please. one of this or that. And it, viral is really the capturing the zeitgeist of a moment. So it's, it's really about creating enough content on a regular basis. Something will, will bite at the right time because of lots of different factors. So we are constantly exploring new ways to apply our storytelling so that we can become more responsive and more reactive to the client's uh, demands or, or um, requirements. So to give you an example, we have CG characters, which are in movies, and the quality that you see in the film isn't a quick process. It takes a lot of lighting, a lot of texturing, and a lot of uh, clever animating, and the iteration process is what makes it look perfect. But we've now developed a system where we can take some of these characters and render them in real time with somebody dressed in a motion capture suit with a facial capture set of cameras on them. And that technology has been built in parallel with what we're doing for render timed uh, feature films. So we can create tools to, first of all, it started as a way to allow our um, in-house people visualize what a sequence might look like. How can we quickly produce renders? But as the quality of the rendering's got better and better and the speed of the processing has got faster, we realized we could actually start making reactive content with characters for the web or for mobile platforms where you could talk to a character like uh, the guy called Gecko, for example, in the mm. States. Um, you can have a real-time conversation. So then how does that brand then start using their asset, their, their brand ambassador to, to sell? Because it's a different type of communication you're now able to have with your audience. Sure. The development of frame store pictures who, who profile on the video and are looking for a different uh, set of projects to, to the mothership. Um, is that in response to different demands coming in from Brown? We want something for twenty, thirty, thirty thousand dollars, not five hundred thousand dollars. Or you know, what, what, what would, what's the strategy behind the frame store pictures initiative? So our live action division has come out of the fact that a we have an, a requirement internally often to shoot. Uh, motion capture um, footage or to shoot reference material of actors giving us performance that we will then replicate on characters. Um, and, and then alongside that, we also have a requirement for our creative people to, to, be, to be able to be creative, to express themselves. So someone like myself who started on the box as, a, as an artist, I then left the box to assist directors shooting things properly, worked uh, in commercials, television long form, then feature films, and I've stood alongside some of the best directors in the world watching them work. For me to now put myself forward as a director, is, it just feels a natural step for me. So for the past 10 years, I've, I've directed pieces for Framestore that have been appropriate for brands who've 
who know exactly what they want and want frame store quality um, on their products. So, so frame store pictures is is an opportunity for in-house people to to be, become directors, um, but it's also an opportunity for brands to approach us with a an, for an end-to-end -end solution uh, with frame store quality all over it. And, and you've seen you've seen some. Uh success on the Movilian platform. And I suppose it's using the latent capacity that is in, in, the, in, in the bigger, wider business when, you know, when presumably those you know, larger teams aren't worrying the whole time with big Hollywood productions. And so you can use that capacity on the frame store pictures projects you know, and, 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 and do a bit of a cost arbitrage across the equipment and, and ameliorate the cost there. Absolutely. I think the success, as I say, the success, our success is built on putting the right teams together for the right projects and take, giving, providing an end-to-end -end solution where we can um, work with a brand on uh, a script at the, at the earliest possible stage, or we'll, we'll help write a script. Someone like myself could direct it, and then I will find the best team out of the people that we have to execute that. And you're right, we can use that to, to fill gaps. Um, but actually, when we're working on an in-house project, we want that to be the best it can possibly be. So sometimes people imagine that you, you might get a B team because we're, we're handling it in-house alongside these other big projects. But actually we put as much if not more care into a production of our own because it has our reputation completely stamped all over it. Sure. And, and just looking back into the, into the past briefly, how, how were people networked when you were first starting out? And how were businesses and brands and projects coming to you? Was there a very set route, a very small, you know, may call it a black book of you know, connections that, that you know, inbound projects? Yes, yeah, so that we, well, landscape yeah. has changed very yeah. much now, hasn't it? Yeah, well, when we first started, everybody was literally in a few square miles or in a square mile in Soho, and projects would come from who you knew, who you worked with last, and the same with our recruitment. We knew a range of freelancers that we would call on. Um, that has changed, that landscape's changed completely for us now. We have, just in our London office, we have over 50 different nationalities working in the London office. And the diversity of the crew and the different range of skills we need means we have to look as wide as possible, throw our net as wide as possible to find the right and best talent. Something on, on, on that point, finding the talents. Now, I've always, always thought it's rather awkward in a cinema when the credits of the film come up and, and the, the only thing there to witness it is the popcorn on the floor because everyone's left and that's the great <laughs> talent that's put the thing together. And so if I look at Mavidium and how her, that's building verified um, you know, identities and associated those with the projects they've worked on, so, so industry peers can see those connections, but also external brands and agencies coming can see those connections, which has sort of validity and, and, and some authenticity that they are who they say they are, they've done the work they say they are, and, and they get the credit for it. So it's not just a... a white text on a black screen with no one watching it. And so I think that's bringing the talent forward and shining a spotlight on that creativity. And um, you know, that, that is an important part of, of finding work you know, in this connected epoch that we live in now. Yes, and I, for us it's very important as well that we recognise our talent and the, and the work that they do. So even seeing their name 400 people down scroll through the screen is really, really important sure. uh, to our talent. So you're right, having a website that people can profile their, their capabilities, their experience, and, and look and see what other people are doing as well, because it is a, um, it is a communicated network, a LinkedIn network. Um, yeah. the, the world of VFX is quite small, even though it has a few thousand people in it. Everybody knows one another. Um, but as the demands and different platforms grows, we also have to expand our connections and find new people to fill, fulfill the demand. So for us that as a business, that's, that's what one of the things I identify as uh, one of the biggest challenges is being able to locate people with the right skills available when we need them um, and often for, a, for a, a, maybe even a small window of time to, to push something over the line or to, to finish a, a project. And, and having the right core skills is really important. So again, finding a, a way to quickly find um, somebody with the specific skill you need and then being able to, um, to store that somewhere so that yeah. you, because we come across so many, we have so many CVs coming in well, I think the important thing on Movidium is that it's the talent that's updating it. And of course, that's only as good as their last film or the last piece of work. So, so it's a continually updating database, whether they're working here or working at a competitor or working in-house at a brand. And it's, it's, it's the, the rising tide for everyone 
if you can see all the connections. Yeah. Um, Mike, really, you know, we, we, we've covered a lot there, and thanks so much for your time today. But just um, there's been some recent news about uh, investment in the business from from Asia and from China in particular um, that is having an absolute resurgence of, of interest in uh, sort of technology and film content, and uh, as you mentioned offline, a, a, a huge middle class that's looking to be entertained. Um, t- tell us more about that dialogue and, and that engagement. Well, China for us is uh, we, we've always wanted to look east because there's a huge market. Um, of middle class people looking to be entertained and they also want they also have their own IP they have some great stories that they want to tell it's not like the Chinese want to invest globally they actually want to invest and grow their own properties for their own audiences so for a a company like Framestore uh, their interest is to have us come in and help grow uh, a VFX community there that can service their their own requirements, but we see it as an opportunity to also grow a talent pool that can also benefit our global uh, workforce and make us a, a global powerhouse. Yeah. Just, just one last thing as well about the, the creative talent, Mike. When you were starting out, the, the tools that uh, perhaps a, a student or a new person coming into the industry you know, has been educated on in their teenage and adolescent years, for example, like Instagram, and Facebook. I mean, the, the, these are. I mean, Instagram has turned everyone into a photographer, right? And 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 20 years ago, very few. 30 years ago, 40 years ago, very few. You know, perhaps had access to some of these remarkable tools and the effects that they can do. So more and more people are perhaps starting off on a creative footing before they get into professional life. Are you seeing that? You know, the demand that is being called for by brands wanting more visual effects, more animations, etc. Is the talent there? because of these creative tools that have inspired people to, to, to get into the creative business? Yes, I think it's much easier to, to um, shoot something, to edit it, to put some sound on it. Um, I had a CV through uh, recently from a guy who was, um, it was an amazing showreel. And yeah. um, it was sent to me from one of our heads of department. This is just one problem with this guy. He's only 17. And he's, he's done this body of work in the last four years in his bedroom. He's completely self-taught. And I, and I think there'll be more and more of that sort of talented person coming out of, of schools and out of their, their own environments as self-taught. And what we have to do as a company is juggle the experience of a generation like myself, um, harnessing the thoughts and potential and creative thinking of this younger generation. I, th- I think we're something like 85% millennial in, in our company. Sure. It's a very young young business. And some of the technologies like VR and AR, I think, are their new storytelling platforms. They will be the thinkers that have grown up with wireless music and wireless imagery that will actually come up with the way to tell stories on these platforms. So for us, it's, it's a mixture of... Um, teaching communication skills, building the softer skills of negotiating and how to put teams together, and then harnessing that New youthful potential. Yeah. And, and would you look to put that on a, 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 a that director, that young, talented director, on, on a roster internally at Framestore, or would you, would you represent him for a particular project? Or how, how, would, how would that mechanic work? Because obviously these you know, roster directors and production companies that roster directors, I mean, they're, they're, some would say are facing some challenges. Mm. Yes, I mean, I I see it more and more now. A few years ago, when we were putting our own roster together, we had internal people, but then I would have people from agencies and people from production companies calling me saying, do you have a position for me? Because we see the model changing. You guys make, physically uh, deliver content, you make it. Um, I mean, I live in an agency world and a lot of what I do, 90% of it never gets made, only 10% turns into something and I'd love to be somewhere that's making all the time. So the model of, of how content is created and who's doing the creation um, is, is still evolving. But we, we see ourselves primarily as content creators and we look to become creative partners with anybody that's trying to make content. We will provide the different skill sets from directing through to finish post and we'll, we'll find a way to um, form a business partnership with anybody at any entry level. Mike McGee, um, one of the founders of Framestore, thanks so much for your time today in, in this absolutely remarkable setting in your Chancery Lane office. Um, perhaps you can send an invite to that 17-year-old director from your Movidian profile and help us build the network. Absolutely. Thank you very much. <laughs>